added and the timetable for debate is set. Among the witnesses before the panel were House Ways and Means Committee Chairman Dan Rostenkowski and New York Congressman Thomas Downey. The Committee on Rules will now come to order. <clears throat> the matter before the Committee today is H.R. 3040 from the Committee on Ways and Means, the Unemployment Insurance Reform Act of 1991. Before I call the Chairman and the ranking member to the uh, table, I'd like to uh, have an opening statement. We all know eight and a half million Americans are out of work. More than a million have been out of work for longer than six months. In August alone, 310,000 Americans dropped out of the labor force, and each and every month another 300,000 or more exhaust their benefits before they can find new jobs. <clears throat> Middle class workers who exhaust their benefits have difficulty finding new jobs, and more than 60 percent had not found work 10 weeks after their benefits have ended. These families are in grave danger of slipping into poverty. In July, the largest number of workers in any month on record and monthly records have been kept for the last 40 years, have exhausted their unemployment benefits, and record numbers are not eligible for extended unemployment aid. These people have slipped out of the workforce. We are now letting them fall through the safety net. At this pace, more unemployed will be without assistance in 1991 than in any year since unemployment insurance program was established. Even measured as a percentage of the overall labor force, the number of Americans who exhaust their benefits is at a record high. Strangely enough, at the same time, we are refusing to provide extended benefits. The Unemployment Trust Fund has built up an $8 billion surplus. Why are the record numbers exhausting their benefits? Not because they are being pushed out of the labor force by new entrants. Baby, baby boomers have already been absorbed, and the shock of large numbers of women, teenagers, and immigrants entering as in the 70s and 80s, is over. The startling fact is that in the 1990s, the labor force just is not growing. The record numbers are not explained by the depth of this recession. All recessions, even relatively mild ones, are just terrible situations. Still, this recession is no worse than the recessions of the 70s or the 80s, so why the record numbers? The problem is with our extended benefits program itself. In 1971, in 1974, 75, 77, 82, 83, and in 1985, we at least enacted temporary measures to supplement the existing extended benefit program. The truth is, even these temporary measures are not enough. The federal eligibility requirements themselves need to be reformed. The unemployment rate in Massachusetts in July was at 9.1%. In August, it was 9.2 percent, well above the national average. But if you live in Massachusetts, you're not eligible for extended benefits. In Michigan, the rate is 9.1 percent. In Florida, it's 8.3 percent. In New York, it's 7.5 percent. In California, it's 7.3 percent, all well above the national average. None of these states qualify for extended benefits. Only Rhode Island and Puerto Rico now meet federal requirements for extended benefits. That means that more than 95 percent of those who exhaust their regular benefits are not eligible for extended benefits. None of these numbers, of course, can express the human side, the suffering, the desperate need, the dislocation, and the slow grinding down of the spirit associated with long-term employment. But the, the numbers do tell us that we must act, and we must act now. <clears throat> Today, the Committee continues its meeting on H.R. 3040, the Unemployment Insurance Reform Act of 1991. On July 31st, the committee met to consider this bill, which makes permanent reforms in supplemental compensation and provides additional benefits now. Benefits now. After taking testimony, we recessed subject to the call of the chair. The next day, just before the August recess, the decision was made to take up a different temporary measure, H.R. 3021 and the committee met on an emergency basis that evening to take up the new bill. As you all know, H.R. 3021 was enacted in an effort to provide a temporary extension of unemployment benefits. However, the benefits were contingent on the President's separate designation of the spend spending as an emergency. Early in August, 
President Bush said he did not consider this an emergency, so funds were not released. So we're here this morning to re resume our hearing on H.R. 3040. I'd like to now turn to the uh, ranking minority le uh, leader, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Solomon, for a statement. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, uh, let me uh, concur with uh, some of what you said. Uh, there certainly is a problem out in, uh, out in the hinterlands of America. Um, but you know, sometimes raising taxes just is not the answer. There was a period of time when Ronald Reagan was President of the United States of America, and for eight years running, we had unparalleled economic growth in this country that created 20 million new jobs and hundreds of thousands of new businesses that actually doubled the revenues coming into the federal government. Doubled it from $500 million to over a trillion dollars. Well, wouldn't you think that this United States Congress, that we representatives, could have done something about getting our spending habits under control when we had this windfall of $500 billion a year coming into the federal coffers? But no, this United States Congress, all of us included, went out and not only spent that $500 billion of new revenue, but we created a debt of $3.7 trillion. Today, we have an international obligation to foreign countries and foreign entities of over $400 billion. How does that stand up to, say, the, uh, the former Soviet Union? They have an international debt obligation of $70 billion. $70 billion for them, $400 billion for us. Can you imagine? They have 285 million people. We have 260 million people. And yet now we're talking about taking money from our defense budget or our domestic budget or whatever and giving it grants and gifts to the Soviet Union uh, over there. Now something is wrong. I've just discovered that my good friend Danny Rostengowski is coming before the committee and now is not going to give us the bill that we thought we had before us before, but now he's going to change that and now he's going to add an additional tax on the employers of this nation. I just came from a hundred hours of, of office hours where I met with labor union leaders, I met with just plain laborers who were not union, I met with small business people and farmers, and the message was, don't take another nickel out of our pockets. Now here we are uh, about to raise taxes on the American people again. I don't know what this Congress is coming to, but I sure hope that level heads will prevail here uh, and that we don't put on the floor a bill that is going to raise taxes on the American people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that introduction, I'd like to introduce the ch <laughs> Chairman of the Committee, Dan Rostenkowski, and the Honorable Bill Archer of Texas. <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to testify uh, before your committee. Uh, Mr. Moakley and members of the committee, I appear before you today to request a modified closed rule for House consideration of H.R. 3040, the Unemployment Insurance Reform Act of 1991. Uh, before the August recess, the Committee on Ways and Means favorably reported this bill with an amendment in the nature of a substitute for the original text. Instead of considering the bill, however, the House and the Senate passed a temporary measure, H.R. 3201, in its place. The President signed the bill on August 17, 1991, but unemployment benefits were not paid because he did not declare an emergency. Today I am asking for a rule for H.R. 3040 so that the much needed permanent changes can be made to the unemployment compensation program. <coughs> Last Friday, the administration announced the unemployment rate had remained unchanged at 6.8 percent. Eight and a half million workers are out of work, and over one million have been out of work for more than a half this year. At the same time, fewer workers are receiving unemployment benefits. Since the beginning of this year, two million workers have exhausted their benefits, and a record of 350,000 ran out of benefits in July alone. Now only about two out of every five unemployed workers get any benefits at all. These unemployment statistics destroy the administration's myth of the rosy scenario. 
they give further support to the urgent need for a more effective unemployment insurance system. The federal government has $8 billion in unemployment trust fund it can use to help these unemployed workers. We owe it to them to provide assistance now when they need it most. Mr. Chairman, H.R. 3040 would make a number of changes in the unemployment insurance system. It would restore extended benefits to long-term unemployed workers, establish the same benefits for ex-military personnel as are available for civilian personnel, restrict unfair disqualifications of otherwise eligible workers, fund a demonstration of the cost-effectiveness of job research assistance, require the Department of Labor to develop a new method for distributing administrative funds to states, and encourage states to accumulate adequate trust fund reserves. The, the committee bill also restores extended benefits to long-term unemployed workers by replacing the ineffective extended benefits program with a new federal supplemental compensation program. Mm -hmm. On top of the normal 26 week provided by the regular state programs, the bill would provide additional weeks of benefits depending on the unemployment rate in each state. Every state would be eligible for at least five weeks, and in some cases as many as 20 additional weeks of benefits. In addition, the bill would reach back to provide benefits to workers who have exhausted their basic benefits since the beginning of the year. Finally, I call to your attention the fact that the bill des designates its provisions as an emergency for all purposes of the Budget Act. It also exempts the new federal supplemental compensation payments from sequestration and waives the pay-as-you-go requirements of the Budget Act. Mr. Chairman, the additional benefits in this bill are crucial to the financial well-being of millions of American workers who want to work but can't find a job. The recession has been tough on them. They deserve our help and will get it if H.R. 3040 becomes law. In fact, over three million unemployed individuals will receive, as a result of, will receive benefits as a result of this bill. Mr. Chairman, I have been instructed by the Committee on Ways and Means to request that the Committee on Rules grant a modified closed rule for the consideration of H.R. 3040, which would, one, provide one hour of general debate to be equally divided between the Chairman and Ranking Minority Member of the Committee, two, provide that the Committee amendment in the nature of a substitute be original text, and three, provide that the freestanding Committee amendment dropping a provision giving states the option to cover non-professional school employees under state employment compensation laws be in order. I might explain, Mr. Chairman, that the committee decided to delete this provision because it raises federal receipts, which could cause the Senate to treat the bill as a revenue bill. Waive all points of order and provide one motion to recommit with or without instructions. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your consideration of this request. And I will gladly answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Archer. Chairman, thank you for giving me an opportunity to appear for your committee. Um, this is really deja vu. Um, I've made uh, specific testimony on this precise bill before to you. I'm not going to belabor the committee by going back over it again. Uh, I have a concern, as uh, the ranking Republican member, Ms. Solomon, said, of adding new taxes which are job deterrent, uh, which are negative toward job creation. Uh, I respect the chairman because he believes in fiscal responsibility, but we're creating new spending programs, and in doing so, we're putting taxes, uh, regressive payroll taxes, uh, on the um, American workers, and we're going to cause more people to be put out of work. In lieu of that, uh, we would be, in effect, having an automatic self-executing declaration of an emergency, which uh, denies the President his prerogatives that were agreed to by the budget agreement last year. We, in effect, are going back on a budget agreement where both sides gave tremendously, 
and which was supposed to be in effect on in effect for five years. Uh, the only exception to that was a jointly declared emergency, independently declared by the Congress and the President. And now, in the terminology of this bill, the right of the President to make a separate independent determination would be denied. So in either event, uh, I see big problems with uh, the legislation. But I will stop there and be glad to respond to any questions. I, I'm not exactly sure that the gentleman from New York said that uh, he now understands that the, the chairman is going to ask for an was, amendment to be offered to, uh, to, to increase the payroll taxes. I, I did not hear that in his explanation. Well, and I, I was just going to ask the question because I didn't hear it. So, uh, uh, Well, I, I have concluded my statement about the bill as presented by the Ways and Means Committee. I have a personal request for an amendment to be made in order. If, would you like me to take that? Why don't you make that not an honest chairman? Well, Chairman Walkley and members of the committee, <clears throat> having concluded my formal presentation on behalf of the Committee on Ways and Means, on my own behalf, I request the Rules Committee to make an order and amendment which would provide the full amount of revenues necessary to comply with the pay-go requirements of last year's budget agreement. However, it also provides the President with the option of funding the amendment by declaring an emergency. My amendment would give the President the full range of options available to him and Congress under last year's budget summit agreement. If he signs the bill, he can comply with the pay-as-you-go requirements by imposing additional federal unemployment taxes to cover the projected cost of the bill, or he can declare an emergency and pay for the bill with the $8 billion reserves in the Unemployment Trust Fund. The President can choose the option he believes is the most fiscally responsible and provide benefits to workers whom he has acknowledged are hurting. If the President chooses to impose additional federal unemployment taxes, the federal unemployment tax rate would be cut from its current rate of 0.8% to 0.4% in 1993 and in 1994. 0 02 per to 0.23% in 1995 and 0.2% in the 1996 and thereafter. At the same time, the federal unemployment taxable wage base would, raise, would rise from the current $7,000 to the equivalence with the Social Security taxable wage base projected to be $58,800 in 1993. In addition, the federal taxable wage base would be decoupled from the state ta uh, taxable wage basis so that there would be no increase in the state unemployment taxes. This amendment would raise about $6.5 billion in federal unemployment taxes by the end of 1996, enough to cover the cost of the bill. If the President, <clears throat> if the president chooses to declare an emergency, the additional federal unemployment taxes would not take effect. The federal unemployment tax rate would remain at 0.8 percent, and the taxable wage base would stay at 7,000. The cost of the bill <clears throat> would be covered by the $8 billion previously paid into the Federal Unemployment Trust Fund for extended benefits. Mr. Chairman, we have some tough decisions to make in this area. We want to help unemployed workers, but we want to comply with last year's budget summit agreement, too. I strongly believe in the pay-as-you-go principles we agreed to last year. In fact, the Committee on Ways and Means was following these principles even before the budget agreement, but the budget sum summit agreement. We should not break our agreement. We should give the President options contemplated in the agreement. He can declare an emergency if he agrees with many members of Congress or he can pay for the bill with increased federal unemployment taxes. In either case, we have complied with the budget summit agreement, and long-term unemployed workers will get the benefits they so desperately need. I have no uh, illusions, um, Mr. Chairman, about the outcome, uh, given permission to offer this on the floor of the House of Representatives, of what will happen to this amendment. But there are those of us uh, who firmly believe uh, that we'd like as much as possible to stick to the budget agreement in that we will pay as you go. And what I'm asking this committee uh, and its members to do is to give us the opportunity to offer the amendment 
And to, for those of us that, for, that, that strongly believe uh, in uh, decreasing the deficit, give us an opportunity to vote. Mr. Chairman, this is not uh, a recommendation from the Committee on Ways no, and Means. This is, a, this is, the this is your own question. personal, and it, it, it makes it optionable, optional with the President whether he goes pay as you go uh, or emergency. Uh, gets into the fund. Mr. Derrick. Mr. Solomon. Well, Mr. Chairman, let me just say to uh, both Danny and Bill, uh, I really do deeply admire and respect both of you. And Danny, I have to respect you even more than Dan Bill uh, <laughs> for, for this reason, that I know you come under a great deal of uh, pressure uh, to do away with your principles. And you have stuck to them. Your committee has, you two in particular. And, and, and we really thank you for that. Uh, and I, for one, am going to support your, your, uh, your amendment being made in order. I'm not going to vote for it when it comes on the floor, but you're entitled to it, and uh, you're certainly entitled to it as the, as the chairman of the committee. Uh, but isn't, isn't this the first time ever that we've ever uh, sort of blackmailed a president? In other words, because it isn't just, as my good friend the chairman here said, an option. Uh, it's uh, either you declare the emergency or the tax goes into effect. In other words, you're, you're taking away his prerogative. And no, no, I'm I don't know of any other time in history we've ever done that. I, I, well, of course, these are unusual circumstances in that we adopted a budget process uh, that uh, I think we're on the, uh, the threshold of ignoring for the rest of this, uh, this year and next year. And all I'd like to do is, uh, is, is for those of us that participated in that process, for those of us that, that reported back to the Congress, and for a great many of members that voted uh, to support the budget process in, in uh, eliminating the deficit uh, be given the opportunity. Uh, Mr. Solomon, this isn't the first time uh, members are going to be asked uh, to ignore uh, raising revenues on a pay-as-you-go basis. Uh, I think uh, if, if, if this amendment is not made in order and or if we aren't given the privilege of voting on it, uh, this will become standard operational procedure of declaring emergencies or just ignoring what the budget agreement was. And all we're going to do is continue to increase the deficit. One of the reasons why we have such a, a disagreement uh, with respect to the, uh, to the highway bill. Uh, I, I'm, I'm one of those firm believers that, that we should not incur any more of a deficit. And uh, I, have a, I have a solid disagreement with the Public Works Committee on that. Well, that was one of the instances that I was commending you for, for sticking to your guns on, on the highway bill. Uh, let me just ask you this. Uh, Mr. Gingrich is going to be coming in and asking for a, a substitute, uh, which talks about uh, incentives for jobs, et cetera. Uh, if his amendment is made in, uh, made in order, uh, we'd like an hour debate on that amendment. If it is not, if this committee doesn't see fit to give him that hour, uh, because Mr. Grattison and, uh, and others, uh, Mr. Army and myself, do have amendments. Uh, would you have any objection to extending the debate, uh, uh, provided only the amendments allowed, requested by you or made in order, well, extending it to a two-hour debate? Uh, there is a question, as I understand it, of germaneness with respect to the, to, to the substitutes of the bills that are going to be offered. but. Uh, there's another problem, Mr. Chairman. It's uh, the Jewish holiday. We have to get out by 1 o'clock on that day. What's that got to do with uh, well, wh what time are we going in? We're coming at 9 o'clock in the morning. And that's the only thing we have to do uh, tomorrow. Uh, I think you'll find out that it's going to exhaust all the time. It's Tuesday. It's uh, not next, tomorrow. Next Tuesday, right. Tuesday. But, yeah. but uh, we have nothing else on the agenda. We, we can't spend four. We're due to adjourn at 1 o'clock. Right. Well, so two hours would not be an unreasonable well, request. people are afraid you're going to run up against the clock. If it can be worked out, I would have no objection. But, but I don't think that's in Mr. Rostenkowski's purview anyway. Uh, that's not within the purview of my jurisdiction. I'll yield that to the committee on rules. Mr. Chairman, just one last question. I don't want to take up too much of the time, but uh, uh, there is another amendment, I believe, kicking around here that is, uh, you mentioned non germaneness which is reminding me of it. Uh, uh, by maybe Mr. Williams that deals with railroad work workers. Uh, are you in favor of that amendment? Uh, 
That, Mr. Solomon, is not within the jurisdiction of the Ways and Means Committee. That is in the jurisdiction of the Commerce Committee. I have no jurisdictional differences or agreements. That will be a But you have always protected your committee and your committee's jurisdictions. And but this is not within this my jurisdiction. You not want this put in your bill, do you? This is not within my jurisdiction. This, this is a judgment that you are going to have to make with respect to the unemployment. Thing. Really Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Solomon. Mr. Quillen. Mr. Chairman. Always you all have uh, difficult jobs and you have thorns in your hands and sticking out your ears and you do the dirty work. But I'm very cognizant of the fact that when people are out of work, they're suffering. But at the same time, the, if the president chooses to go the route that you're going and should your amendment pass, Mr. Danny, how many businesses are going to be put out of operation? Is it going to be a, a rollover, more unemployment? Because really, uh, the small businesses are having a terrible time now paying the taxes that are imposed on them. Is it going to be a round robin? Are we going to create more unemployment? I hope not. In Tennessee, we have 6.7 percent unemployment. In my district, it's less than that. And the, the unemployment benefits under your measure would be extended for 10 weeks. Well, there, there's a formula that's included in this, uh, Mr. Quillen. Uh, but the problem is that <clears throat> there are contributions being made to the trust fund, and yet the formula by which people are made available for unemployment compensation prevents them from getting the compensation that's necessary. And that, I think, is what we're trying, we're trying to solve here. Because you've got it, $8 billion in the trust fund now that, that no one except in two states is drawing down on or qualifies to draw down on. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not here advocating any legislation that's going to create more unemployment. I hope, I hope that this legislation Well, it just occurred to me that that might be what we're trying to do. I certainly am opposed to the legislation, and I'll say that out front, but I think we ought to think carefully of what we're trying to do here. I've always supported a constitutional amendment mandating that the government can't spend any more than it takes in. But on the other hand, we, we could continue to increase taxes to have a more income in order to spend it. So that's what we're doing here, in my opinion. I think the people who are out of a job should be carefully considered. They're suffering, and we know that. But the right solution is not just handing out something at the cost of the employer. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cullen. Mr. Barnier, any questions? Yes. Uh, well, you know, we're, we're not handing out anything uh, at the cost of the employer. The, the issue here is, uh, is whether or not uh, the Congress, uh, having been gone for six weeks and in, in visiting with our constituents, feels that there is sufficient pain and suffering out there to do something about alleviating that pain and suffering. Now, I don't know what you all saw, but when I went back home, the short time I was there this, this summer, I wish I would have been back there actually a little bit longer, but had I, what I did see uh, was a lot of pain and suffering. I got 10 percent of my people out of work, 10 percent. We've got 9.3 percent in Michigan. And it's just not economic deprivation, as everybody in this room knows. It's mental anguish. Anybody that's been in a household that's had a mother or, or a father or the head of the house a lot of work knows what pain that is. Now, my colleague from New York, Mr. Downey, I've heard him say this a number of times, and I think it's an accurate description. It's the ultimate obscenity to have 10 million people, 8.5 out of work plus almost 2 million have dropped off the rules, out of work to have an $8 billion trust fund and not being able to tap into that. That is wrong. And what we're doing, uh, Jerry, is, is, is not saying to the President, uh, we're blackmailing you. We're giving him three choices. You name two. You can do the tax, 
to replenish the fund, pay as you go. A, B, if you don't want that, you can do an emergency. Like you did for the Israelis, like you did for the Turks, like you did for Bangladesh, like you did for the Kurds. You take care of our people that are suffering here at home. Or if you don't like either of those options, you can veto the bill. And those seem to me the where we are with this issue. And um, uh, so I, I commend the committee for, for bringing this to us. And uh, I can't think of, uh, with the exception of a tax cut bill that will get this economy moving again, and I believe we need one and we need it soon to get it moving, I can't think of anything that is more important this week or next week than this bill. Thank you, Mr. Boyner. Mr. McEwen. Uh, Mr. Rosenkowski, uh, you, you mentioned your amendment is not as chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. I guess that's kind of like the judge instructing the jury to not disregard the statement of the witness, but uh, I'll attempt to do that. And in that context, uh, the, the, if your amendment were to pass, it would raise revenues for the next fiscal year, correct? And that the expenditure would be from this one, which would still leave the imbalance that I presume Mr. Panetta, or Mr. Panetta will be concerned about, is it? As I, <clears throat> as I propose the amendment, the pay-as-you-go formula is met in the five-year period. All right. There are, there are valleys and... Uh, you start at uh, lag. All right. One other thing. You mentioned that uh, the military under this bill would be treated the same as all so other workers. Yes. Is that a, a fair assumption? As I understand it, if a person voluntarily leaves his job, he doesn't qualify for unemployment compensation, but in this case, if a person resigned from the military, they would. Is that, am I incorrect in that assumption? Oh, I see. Um, it, it, this amendment has been approved by the entire committee. Uh, and uh, what it is, is when the tour of duty is up, uh, there is the possibility here that re-upping is not available, and this is forced retirement, or it, it's separation. And all this, <clears throat> all we do provide for in this bill is that the civilian population is treated the same as the military, or the military is treated the same as the civilian. But if, if the option <clears throat> to re-up is available, then, then he is not automatically qualified. No, I, I believe he's still qualified. Uh, which, thank you very much. General sure, just, uh, sure, sure. That is not in the bill. You said it's, uh, the committee has approved that amendment? That's, that's in the bill. It's, in the oh, it, it's not in your amendment. This it's in, in the bill that uh, you already voted for. Yeah, this was in the bill. But it is this not, is not, this is not, part not in your amendment. amendment. That's no. why I was trying to clear up. Oh. Oh. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think our colleague from Michigan did a very good job in outlining the problem that faces our country now. And, uh, and the reason that we do need to take action. I, I've been a little bit, bit um, confused by uh, our colleague from, from um, uh, New York and my friend from, from Tennessee talking about taxes, taxes, taxes. This seems to confuse the issue because, Mr. Chairman Austin Kasky, could you clarify, it's my understanding that this bill does not require any additional taxes, but rather it provides funds uh, that are that are in a surplus uh, in the unemployment fund that have been placed there for this very purpose, the and bill that there does provide that, and that there are no taxes. Yes, sir. We were referring to the amendment which uh, he is going oh, to. You offer. mean the amendment that that he mentioned that he said wasn't going to pass? <laughs> right. Well, that I can't say. But I'm I mean, not, I think I'm that's not going to vote for it. Yeah. And, he, and I think the chairman and said I he wasn't going to pass. We're not talking about the bill, or at least okay. I wasn't. We're talking about the proposed amendment. Okay. okay, so the bill then provides no taxes whatsoever. The bill only provides that we use those funds that were set aside for this purpose. That's my and understanding. That, and that the only taxes are the amendment that, that, our, that the gentleman from uh, Illinois in good faith is presenting, but that also in good faith said was not going to pass. Well, it, so is Mr. that Gordon, gentleman is correct. What, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do is, is for those of us that that agree very firmly oh, on the budget agreement yeah. and are committed to paying as you yeah. go, make this available. You're right, I think and that, I respect and I respect your position uh, in that. I'm just trying to get get the debate here clarified in that 
Again, there are no taxes uh, in this bill. It only provides that those funds that were set aside and that were paid for already for this very purpose uh, be used. Uh, thank you. Gentleman's correct. Actually, the the chairman is uh, courageously uh, standing up for his principles sure. on the uh, uh, because of the budget uh, uh, recommendations of last year. Gentlemen, thank you very much for a very uh, good presentation. The Honorable Thomas Downey of New York to be joined with the Honorable Willis Grattison. <clears throat> Mr. Downey. Mr. Chairman, I don't think uh, I need to uh, belabor uh, what has already gone on here. You, in your opening statement, touched on all of the important points with respect to this bill. But let me just make a couple more that uh, have not been covered. The changes that we seek to make in this bill, unlike the one that we passed uh, before the August recess, are permanent changes. We've had to temporarily try to repair this system for the last 15 years, and now we find, as you pointed out in your opening statement, that the extended benefit program simply is not working. And the reason for that is we use this mechanism of determining what the insured rate of unemployment is to trigger extended benefits. And because different states have different procedures with respect to determining who, in fact, receives unemployment, you could have a situation, as Butler does in South Carolina, where fewer than 20, between 20 and 30 percent of the people in the state are insured unemployed. Uh, and they have to reach, that insured unemployment rate has to reach a total of 5 percent of the total workforce out of work and insured before you would trigger the extended benefits. So the need to change what is known as the IUR to the TUR uh, is evident by what we see here today, an expanding trust fund uh, not being utilized properly. And what we propose to do is to make a permanent change to the uh, total unemployment rate, which is based on the Department of Labor's household survey. Um, and I think that is a far more appropriate way for us to determine how extended benefits uh, should be paid out. And you would not have the preposterous situation where only the state of Rhode Island uh, currently qualifies, and your state, which has 9 percent unemployment, uh, and the mine, which has 7.3, uh, currently do not. And we phase in, this is also a fairly important change, b based on the percentage of unemployment, it's 10, 15, and 20 weeks, 6 percent, 7 percent, and 8 percent, respectively. Um, the other change, of course, from the other bill has to do with the, uh, the point that has already been discussed, which, has, uh, which is the uh, issue of declaring the emergency. We don't leave that to presidential discretion. The signature declares it. Um, th this is essential that we take care of this issue, not only for the people who are now uh, unemployed and suffering, but also in future recessions. Let me say one quick word about the tax. The tax passed the subcommittee. Um, and uh, I will, uh, I would ask you both uh, on behalf, since this, uh, this is the product of my subcommittee, uh, for you to favorably grant uh, Chairman Rostenkowski's request. Uh, for Democrats, it's never easy to talk about taxes because it gives you guys the opportunity to label us as big spenders. The reality of this tax is, however, that we are lowering the rate and expanding the base. And the advantage to doing that is you do not have a regressive base on which to generate revenue for unemployment compensation extended benefits. The, the further reality is that by expanding the base and, and lowering the rate, that workers who are low income workers will actually have a reduced burden or employers who have this uh, rate, the, the rate will go from 0.8 percent to 0.4 percent in the first two years and then a final three years down to 0.2 percent. What this means in dollars is it's $56 per worker today. Uh, rising to probably $112 uh, on upper income workers uh, after the enactment, if, if the uh, amendment were to be agreed to. By triggering it in January of 1993, we don't run the risk of levying this additional burden uh, on workers, uh, on employers in the middle of a recession. Uh, it is the responsible thing in my mind uh, to do and uh, necessary to make sure not only uh, that we comply with the budget agreement, but also that uh, the trust fund remains full uh, for any future recession. So I would ask you to favorably review the chairman's uh, request. Mr. Gratison, you're not speaking on the same subject, are you? Or are you? It is related, Mr. Chairman, right. and I have a brief statement if, it, if it's agreeable. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I I'm strongly opposed to the provisions contained in Title V of the uh, Bill H.R. 3040, which is before you. 
Adoption of the three provisions included in Title V would be a very troubling precedent, would undermine the discipline observed thus far with regard to the budget this year, and in my view would be tantamount to a repeal of the bipartisan budget agreement, which was just approved last year, less than a year ago. Let me be specific about the three provisions and do it very briefly. Section 501 is a directed scorekeeping provision that specifies the dollar amounts that OMB is to use in estimating the costs under the bill. By including this provision in the text of the bill, a provision which is contrary to the Budget Act of last year, the authors of this legislation have both politicized the cost estimate and by implication the Budget Office, Congressional Budget Office. The authors must be fully aware that the President has promised unequivocally to veto any bill that includes such directed scorekeeping. One can only presume, therefore, that guaranteeing a veto is part of the strategy in moving this bill, so be it. But I think we ought to say that out up front. Someone unfamiliar with the convoluted politics of this bill would find it most peculiar that Section 501, the directed scorekeeping provision, is immediately followed by a section, it's 502, which states that the scoring numbers are irrelevant. Section 502 provides that the Unemployment Insurance Reform Act will be treated as an emergency by the President and the Congress, and none of the costs will be counted under the Balanced Budget and Emergency Deficit Control Act of 1985. The emergency designation should be used to respond to events which are sudden, unpredictable, unforeseen, and not permanent. The current unemployment situation is none of the above. Both Congress and the President fully anticipated current economic conditions when budgets were submitted last year. The actual experience which we're, in, which we're seeing uh, in the economy is very close uh, to the projections both of the, both of the Office of Management budget and CBO uh, earlier this year. Uh, Congress has had an ample opportunity to budget for expansion of unemployment benefits and has chosen not to do so. And this bill would establish a permanent expansion of benefits which will last long after this current round of unemployment uh, has receded. Furthermore, this section seeks to deny the President the statutory right to determine independently whether enacted spending programs should be designated as an emergency. It attempts to treat the unemployment bill as an emergency even if it were enacted over the President's veto. I personally doubt the legality of this language. I vehemently oppose its inclusion. It clearly violates the letter as well as the spirit of the emergency clause adopted in last year's budget agreement, which was very, very carefully crafted to apply only to those items designated as emergency by the President and the Congress acting separately and independently. Section 502 makes an end run around this understanding, and frankly, while not much has been said about this, in my opinion, it's more likely to trigger lengthy litigation. Uh, than it is to provide immediate assistance to the long-term unemployed. Finally, Section 502 would prohibit all new budget authority, outlays, and receipts resulting from the bill from being considered for purposes of the Budget Enforcement Act. This section and Section 503, which exempts the spending from the sequester procedures, completely undermines the core of the Budget Act. It is for these reasons, Mr. Chairman, that I request the Rules Committee to permit an amendment which would strike Title V. Let me speak very briefly about Chairman Rostenkowski's request. I think his request for a vote is commendable. It at least attempts to bring this, provision, this, this proposal in line with the Budget Act. But it doesn't cure the problem. He carefully has told us that the money is raised over a five-year period to balance the expenditures over a five-year period. But the spending is front-loaded, the taxes are rear-loaded, and were his proposal adopted, uh, it is entirely possible that a sequester would be triggered, resulting in a payment situation which none of us would like to see, which is a reduction in Medicare benefits to pay for an increase in unemployment compensation benefits. Not a very happy situation. Let me br briefly summarize that I think the surest way to prolong this recession is to abandon what little spending restraint we have under the Budget Act. And approval of this proposal would clearly undermine the Budget Act. Thank you for your patience, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Radisson. Any questions of the panel? Any questions, Mr. Solomon? Mr. Chairman, if I, if I just might uh, submit the administration's position uh, for the record. Without objection. Uh, pass that over to would. Uh, Chairman, let me just say to, uh, to both I Tom Downey and to Bill Gratison both, uh, we 
certainly appreciate and commend all the work you do on this area. I know it's a, it's a difficult, difficult situation. Uh, Bill, your amendment that you would like made in order uh, shifts, again, the scoring back from, OMB, uh, from CBO over to OMB and waives the emergency enactment. It, yeah, That's it, what your it amendment would, does. It would de delete the, uh, uh, the waiver of the sequester provision. It would basically say, look, if we're going to do this, it should be done in a way that's compatible and consistent with the Budget Act. That's all I'm trying to do. Tom, you mentioned uh, that you wanted uh, the Roskinkowski tax amendment to be made in order, uh, and I agree with you. Do you, are, you uh, do, are you in favor of that amendment? Yeah. Did you say it came out of your subcommittee? It passed, it passed favorably in the subcommittee. Favorably. Okay, but it's not a committee amendment. It's a Roskinkowski amendment because it never made it through the full committee. No, it was uh, deleted in the full committee. Thanks. That's all. Mr. Uh, but by the way, just in passing, since the matter has come, it was deleted on a bipartisan basis, and the amendment to delete it was offered by a member from the majority side. Right, that's correct. Cool. Mr. Moody of Wisconsin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tom, you mentioned that the taxes would actually be lowered but broaden the base. That's correct. Cool. So actually, it would be more uh, tax income one way or the other. No, that's 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 right, Jimmy. The, um, so it would affect uh, the the industries that uh, and businessmen now not paying the pay uh, triggered under the situation. Well, it, first of all, the the way this we the all businesses. Um, ha let me divide the the answer to the question. In a state, you have uh, most states for the purposes of determining unemployment compensation have uh, what is known as experience rating based on the employer's track record of having its employees be unemployed. Um, I, I believe they have experience rating in Tennessee as an example. Um, and all of the employers, regardless of experience rating, pay the 0.8 percent uh, for extended benefits. So what this... On the if they have enough employees to... Well, regardless, of, regardless of their employees past unemployment history, they pay uh, this flat rate of 0.8 percent. So we would change that 0.8 to basically 0.2 in the distant in, in five years. But you're right, the rate we go up, the net result would be that if you had higher wage workers, increase you would pay tax. higher taxes. Increase in tax. Yeah, yeah, it would be an increase. Now, uh, do you agree with the chairman's uh, statement that he didn't think his amendment would pass anyway? You know, I, I think the uh, the Yankees have a, a better chance of winning the World Series uh, than this amendment does of, uh, of uh, passing. Got to be honest. careful. We're on C-SPAN time. Huh? <laughs> I, I apologize to Jim Niederlander uh, in advance. Uh, being a Yankee fan, I feel I can make this statement without uh, fear of contradiction. I would say the same about the Reds this year. Yes, yes that's right. Both our teams have fallen. The Yankees used to win all the time. I know, I know. It's so the we, we've lost nine seats uh, in our state, as Jerry will tell you, and our teams have both fallen on hard times. Well, anyway, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The Honorable Leon Panetta, Chairman of the Budget Committee. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, I submit my statement for the record. Without objection, the gentleman's entire statement will appear on the record. Uh, and I, I will be very brief. Uh, I rise in uh, support of uh, the amendment uh, that uh, the Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee has asked to offer. And I do that because I think it is uh, in keeping with the uh, spirit of the budget agreement to uh, provide uh, the option to the President uh, of paying for it uh, or of declaring it an emergency uh, or vetoing it. Uh, clearly, there is a need out there. I think uh, the gentleman from Michigan expressed it best. I certainly found that in my district, that there is indeed uh, a desperation with regards to the uncertainty we now have in the economy, and it's affecting a lot of people. Uh, so the need is there. Uh, budget agreement was not designed uh, in a way that uh, it would not address needs within our society. I mean, uh, specifically, the budget agreement was designed not only to achieve deficit reduction, but it also provided a means to meet needs within our society. We recognized that we would face exactly this kind of situation. And the way to deal with the situation was to either uh, provide that it be declared an emergency or to pay for the additional benefits. Those are the options under the budget agreement. Uh, obviously, we tried to have it designated an emergency. The President did not agree with that approach. Uh, so obviously, it seems to me that uh, the more appropriate approach now is to try to provide a way to pay for it in accordance with the President's concern. He basically indicated that he didn't want to break the budget with this. Uh, one way not to break the budget is to provide the revenues to pay for the benefits, and the members ought to have that opportunity to vote on that option. 
So for those reasons, uh, I would strongly support the amendment that has been requested here by the Chairman. Let me just make a final point, uh, Mr. Chairman, because uh, I can sense that uh, the budget agreement uh, is going to be under a great deal of pressure uh, over these next few months. This budget agreement is not going to stick unless both the Congress and the President are willing to stand by it. And it means that uh, it isn't just a question for the Congress as to how we decide to, to stick by it. It's also a question of how the President decides to implement it in a fair and balanced way. What concerns me is if the President is allowed to select his emergencies uh, that he has, uh, in fact, selected, uh, and then does not recognize the emergencies within our own society that I think are real, uh, there is no surer way to rip apart this, this kind of budget agreement. I think he's got to recognize that there is a need out there, uh, and whether he wants to pay for it or declare it an emergency, uh, somehow all of us have a responsibility, both the Congress and the President, to try to meet the need that's out there. That, that I hope, is what both the, the executive and legislative branch focus on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions of the Chairman? Mr. Solomon. Mr. Chairman, uh, in, um, the Chairman of the Budget Committee knows uh, that we, we have deep respect for him, too, and uh, for his principal stance. And I won't ask him. Uh, I'm going to vote for the amendment. <laughs> uh, I, I know. I won't ask you how you're going to vote on the bill if the amendment fails. <laughs> uh, how much is the federal deficit going to be for this fiscal year? Uh, the estimate. Uh, CBO or whoever. Yeah, obviously the estimate varies depending on whether you use OMBs or CBOs. Uh, right now the uh, estimate by OMB is that it's about $348 billion for 92. Are you talking about the. $348 billion? Present, yeah, for, the, for 92 is what I, I'm, we're looking at for uh, deficit projections. CBO indicates that that number will be closer to about $364 billion. Isn't that something? That's about what we spend on our defense budget. My That's God, correct. the deficit's bigger than the defense budget. That's why I'm here asking us to uh, not increase the deficit, but to pay for what we want to do. What, under Mr. Uh, Rostenkowski's amendment, uh, it seems to me that, that the bulk of those revenues, and I've been trying to read the amendment and to, and to figure out how it works, but uh, the bulk of those revenues uh, come after October 1st of 1990. Uh, Three? I believe it's three. Uh, 1993. I, Doesn't that then create, uh, in other words, we're going to be using some of that $8 billion that Tom Downey was talking about uh, that is in the fund. And if that lowers that fund by a considerable amount, which it will, doesn't that even increase the deficit more because you don't have revenues coming in? We've, you know, we've looked at this issue in terms of uh, trying to provide relief in what is obviously a very weak economy. And I think it makes sense when you're trying to provide this kind of unemployment compensation and then pay for it, not to put the burden of these taxes on while we're still in the process of trying to come out of a recession. And so I think for purposes of the committee, they designed it in probably the best fiscal sense, which is to try to put these, this burden on later on and try to recoup uh, the costs over the five-year period. We designed the budget agreement over a five-year period. I guess my approach is that if they can recoup all of the costs in that period of time, I think that meets the spirit of the agreement. Specific answer to your question, though, is in the short term, in that first year when those taxes are not in place, it would do that. Thank you very much. Mr. Quillen? Any questions? No questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Chairman. Sure. The Honorable Richard Army. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me say at the outset, my sport is football, and I'm going to take today as a first event in a long association that you and I will have as the Cowboys and the Patriots make their way to the Super Bowl. All right. That's going to be a long wait. <laughs> Giants' efforts to the contrary notwithstanding. Let me uh, say, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm here again to ask that you allow an amendment on my behalf and protect an amendment on my behalf that would enable us to add a uh, new section to the bill at the end of the bill uh, that would uh, repeal the ill-conceived luxury taxes that were incorporated in the budget summit agreement of last year. After a, a clear uh, experience of the first six months of, the of this year, we have seen, while the taxes have been in effect, 
a devastating impact on employment, sales, output, production in the five industries uh, experienced. In the boat manufacturing industry alone, we lost 19,000 jobs from this tax in the first six months. Uh, I believe this is germane to this issue since we are dealing here with a concern for the unemployed. The frank fact of the matter is that should we repeal these taxes, we would not only reduce the number of unemployed uh, looking to draw on unemployment compensation funds, but would we, we would save the Treasury from the continuing experience of losing $5 in revenue for every dollar generated by these taxes. This is all well documented in a study that is done by the uh, minority staff of the Joint Economic Committee under my direction. Even after uh, adjusting for the uh, recessionary trends that were under place at the time the tax was imposed. One final point I might make about this, irrespective of the, uh, of the uh, improving impact that this would have on all five of the sectors, the boat industry is a particularly important case because this industry was a uniquely competitive American industry. There was not a foreign boat manufacturing firm in the world that can compete with our American firms prior to the imposition of this tax. Now what we find happening in the very few cases where American firms are going out of business, the, uh, the uh, facilities are being purchased uh, by for where something is happening, and that's not very often. Uh, but what we find is the facilities are being purchased by foreign enterprise for uh, exportation to foreign consumers and registration in foreign ports. So we not only have the opportunity here to save the uh, Treasury from a continued depletion of its resources five to one uh, to restore jobs, but hopefully if we act quickly to salvage this uniquely competitive industry. I think this is a timely opportunity to do what must be done and can best be done effectively only if it's done early. And I thank you for your patience. Thank you. Any questions, gentlemen yes, from Texas? <clears throat> Mr. Derrick. Mr. Army, consistency is not necessarily a prerequisite to being a member of this body, but it does seem to me a little inconsistent that uh, you're asking us to attack uh, an amendment on an unemployment compensation bill to repeal a luxury tax. You know, uh, I had a, a call the other day from a company that makes automobiles that uh, I guess they probably the lowest price one they have is about $50,000 or something like that. Suggested to me that uh, because of this unemployment, because of this luxury tax, that their sales were off, I don't remember, 35 or 40 percent or something like that. They were blaming it all on the luxury tax. And I said to the, the man, listen, you know, we're going through a recession right now. I said, you don't think that has anything to do with, with the way your sales are? Finally, after pressure, he admitted that about three-fourths of it was probably due to the recession. And I would suggest to you that if you go back and look at the figures on most of these companies back in the early 80s when we had the other uh, the most uh, recent recession, that you're going to find that a lot of this is induced by the recession. I'm not suggesting to you that some of it might not be because of the luxury tax, but I think that most of it you'll find would be as a result of, of the recession. Well, certainly, and I don't want to speak towards the uh, economic insight or economic methodologies employed by an automobile retailer uh, and his impressionistic uh, response to your questions, but the well, fact is—he wasn't a retailer. He was a—I mean, he was the manufacturer. That uh, okay, but in any event, the fact is, when we did the study with the Joint Economic Committee staff, a PhD <coughs> economist, well trained, we made the adjustment for the current secular trend in the economy before we came up with our. Well, uh, the other thing I might say about these taxes and their impact on employment within the affected sectors is they're highly tractable. That is to say, particularly you see this in the light airplane manufacturing industry, it's so devastating to the state of Kansas, that you can trace the, the lost jobs to the contract orders that were canceled, where the reason given by the person when canceling the order was, I'm not going to pay this tax, I'll buy a used airplane. Uh, this also shows up very, very clearly in terms of the high tractability in the boat manufacturing. But the point still remains, if in fact our concern is a relief 
for the unemployed Americans, and if we have an opportunity to hear, here to take at least some segment of them and say, not only will we give you relief through the generosity of our treasury, but we will give you even better relief through a restoration of your ability to go back to work, it seems to me an even better movement. For well, you know, uh, Mr. Army, let, let me just say one closing thing about PhD uh, economist. Uh, you know, uh, that is a, a very inexact science. I remember when I was on the budget committee back in the uh, in the mid-70s. We had 17 PhDs uh, in, in economics there. And, and they made predictions, and I, I watched their predictions, and I could have gone down to South Carolina and found a little old lady that reads your palm for $5 that could have predicted it equally as well as they did. Yeah, but they, well, she wouldn't have changed as much, though. No. <laughs> let, me, let me say that uh, precise predictions in economics, of course, are as uh, difficult to come by as they are in, we in the prediction of weather. But in this case, we are not predicting the result, the future results of an action. We are analyzing the in, uh, as it were, the ex ante, analyzing the actual results of the action with very tractable data. And uh, insofar as your concern is over the uh, acumen of PhD economists, I can say that you should feel reassured by the fact that this study was done under my direct supervision. <laughs> but you were the one who uh, suggested that it was also done by PhD economists in your earliest days. Yes, but those PhDs were working under your direct direct well, in that case, I'm sure that's In that absurd. case, everything is all right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Solomon. Mr. Chairman, let me say to Mr. Army that uh, you missed an earlier colloquy where uh, we pointed out that uh, back during the Reagan administration's eight years, when we cut taxes, we created 20 million new tax-paying jobs and hundreds of thousands of small and big businesses that actually doubled the federal revenues coming into the federal coffers in that eight-year period, doubled it annually without even raising taxes a nickel, doubled it from $500 billion up to over a trillion dollars in revenues, and this irresponsible Congress spent every nickel of it and developed a $3.7 trillion debt on top of it. That all goes to show you that repealing this tax would create jobs, tax-paying jobs, which would actually lower that deficit. I'm going to offer your amendment, and I'm going to offer another amendment that most people in this committee also are co-sponsors of, and that is to repeal that boat user fee out there that passed the House on a, um, on a resolution of concern by, I think, 462 votes. We're going to have a chance to vote on that on this bill, too, because that will cut taxes because a fee is a tax, and we will raise more revenue coming into this, uh, to these coffers. Well, the be glad to yield to either one of these. Yeah, well, I was, you know, uh, was Ronald Reagan president during the 1980s? I mean, when, we, sure became, when, we, when we became the greatest debtor nation yeah. in the That's world. That's right, caused when, by when, you when, and when this Jimmy, United States when Jimmy Congress. Co well, well, now, just wait a minute. When Jimmy Carter, the last, Jimmy Carter, the last year that he was the president of the United States, the deficit was less than $50 billion. The By the mid-1980s, the deficit of this country was three-quarters of a trillion dollars. Our national debt went up three times during, I mean, pre, I mean, who was president during those years? I mean, was he not there? That's what we hear, but uh, is that, was that true? Let's, he was uh, a great president. Let's stay a little, back if, to if, let's stay a little I, closer to the subject matter. If I could respond to the gentleman from New York very quickly, and I know you're anxious to move on, uh, but the basic fundamental point that you lower taxes in a recession is included in Keynes's general theory written in 1936. It should not be news to anybody in the economics profession. And prior to Reagan, uh, it was best and most vividly and most incidentally tr well tractably illustrated by the Kennedy uh, tax cuts of the early 1960s where John Kenneth, or I'm sorry, where John F. Kennedy was credited by the economics profession. I, as a young undergraduate, remember. He was one remember, of the good Kennedys, that's right. I remember, but it was credited with teaching us how to apply fiscal policy. So this is not a new concept. And it's certainly one that's well docu documented in American uh, uh, counter-cyclical fiscal experience. I get you a little All right. on this. Since you agree with the Keynesian theory on reducing taxes in recession, do you also agree on his other theories of, of government um, spending and things of this nature? Well, or is this just selective? Is that just the only, you just no, like no. that part of it? Do you, no. do you dis disregard the rest of his theories? No, no not at all. I don't uh, disregard the rest of his theory. The, the unfortunate fact is with the deficit at the uh, level w which we are experiencing it today and the rigors of the budget agreement, 
we cannot apply Keynes' spending uh, side of the fiscal policy formula. Uh, my only complaint with Keynes on the spending side of the formula was he did at one point at least say it didn't matter what we spent the, the money on. I think it matters a great deal what you spend the money on. But the expansionary impact of increased spending during a recession, of course, yeah. is uh, a very much an integral part of countercyclical fiscal policy. Unhappily, it's not an option available to us given So you agree with Keynes when he agrees with you? Um, I agree. I think if Keynes were here today, he would say that you can uh, respond to the current recession by increasing spending if, in fact, you uh, are willing to accept the budget deficit increase that goes with it. Keynes, of course, ex ex uh, his concept was that you would do <coughs> deficit spending in recessionary years and then retire the deficit then in, in good years when you wanted to use the counter-cyclical policy for an inflationary period. Unhappily, we, we have a deficit that makes this option untenable politically to us, so the only element in Keynes's counter-cyclical fiscal policy that's available to us is the taxation part. Uh, and I, I certainly would like to have us with greater fiscal policy latitude than we have, but it's a corner that we're stuck in until we can resolve the de deficit dilemma. Mr. Quillen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, contrary to the beliefs of many, I think you have a good amendment. We all know that the luxury tax on boats and aircraft is killing the market, uh, putting people out of work. In many instances, of closing businesses. So I think it's a good amendment and we should do something about it. All of this talk about theories, we face the fact today people are losing jobs because of what the Congress did. We should turn it around and make this amendment order and pass it, and I think it would be healthy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Quillen, for your confidence. I, I might say that contrary to uh, Chairman Rostenkowski's predictions for the fate of his requested amendment, I am confident that should this amendment be allowed, it will be passed, and I think quite frankly, overwhelmingly so. Oh, Mr. McEwen. I completely agree. I thank you for offering your amendment. Common sense would dictate that if Congress did something that destroys jobs and reduces revenue and increases the taxes, that Congress ought to quit it. And uh, those who predicted this would happen have been proven to be correct. Now it's just a, a matter of pride of authorship as to whether or not the Congress is willing to concede this was a drastic error. It is counterproductive to any moral values that we have if we believe in employment and we believe in, in helping the economy and creating jobs that pay taxes and all of those sort of things. This uh, is a product of what Churchill referred to the cult of envy. It's cute popular maybe in some circles to stand up and pound the desk and say you're going to tax the people who have a boat. Maybe that gets applause, but it, putting people out of work, increasing the deficit, destroying revenues is not something with which we should be any longer associated. And I think your amendment corrects that mistake. And given the option, the only thing that can prevent it is if the majority, the Democrats on this committee, deny that right to you. If the Democrats permit you to allow that to come to the floor, then I think this error can be corrected, and I'm certainly hopeful that it will before the remainder of those people at Carter and, and Hatteras and the other places that have had to go into bankruptcy, before the very tail end of those are currently employed uh, lose the jobs that remain. Thank you. I may just say that uh, the people who own the boats have already demonstrated clearly they can float last year's boat. Unhappily, the skilled plastics fabricators are not able to spend last year's wages, and we need to help them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for excellent testimony, Mr. Army. Mr. Uh, Williams, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, if the Congress should twice pass an extended uh, unemployment benefits bill and both times uh, leave out railroad workers in America, uh, I think that we would uh, be correct in explaining to those workers unemployed for an extended period of time that leaving them out and not covering them in the same manner in conditions as we covered all other unemployed workers in America was simply unintended. They fell through the cracks. We didn't mean it to happen. Uh, thankfully, 
we have, with the assistance uh, and encouragement of the representatives of those workers, uh, found that there is this uh, unintended consequence in what we're about to do here. And so to fix it, I urge uh, the members of this committee to allow me to offer an amendment to H.R. 3040 to provide extended unemployment benefits in the same manner and condition, precisely, to railroad workers as are granted to others in the legislation uh, before you. Uh, the CBO uh, has issued a preliminary cost estimate uh, for this legislation of $10 million. The current balance in the railway, or rather the railroad unemployment insurance trust fund is $321 million. Uh, the trust fund folks tell us that the average steady state balance they try to maintain is $225 million. So we have almost $100 million surplus, one might say, above the steady state uh, balance. The $10 million cost if one wanted to uh, continue the surplus at $100 million more than what may potentially be needed, that $10 million cost could be made up in the new revenues coming in during fiscal year 1993. This fund is self-executing. Uh, the Congress doesn't decide to raise the tax for this fund. That's determined by the board uh, that runs this fund. And so they could make up this money uh, uh, if they decided to do so. Uh, on their own. As you know, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, uh, from Chairman Rostenkowski's words to you, this is not under the jurisdiction of Ways and Means, but rather is under the jurisdiction of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Um, <coughs> the uh, chairman of the subcommittee that handles this is Congressman Al Swift of Washington. He's a co-sponsor with me on this amendment and urges you to uh, allow me to offer it. Likewise, chairman of the full committee, Mr. Dingell, has asked me to submit to you, for the record, two letters, one which he has sent to Chairman Moakley and the other which he has sent to me. Both letters uh, ask the members of this committee to make my amendment in order. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Williams. I, I guess what you were trying to communicate to us, you don't see any jurisdictional problem there, a turf problem, I think, is the uh, common word there. I do not see one. Mr. In fact, I believe one does not exist. Yeah, Mr. Rostenkowski didn't indicate otherwise. Mr. Uh, Mr. Oh. Chairman, uh, Pat, did you, have you, have you uh, cleared your amendment with the parliamentarian? Is it a germane? Uh, it would be amendment? a germane uh, amendment, Mr. Solomon. It doesn't require a, a waiver of. Uh, it requires a budget. We, uh, we do ask that all points of order against it be waived. That's correct. We do ask that. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Frost? No questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, support the gentleman's amendment. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Chairman, I want to compliment uh, our friend from Montana for his presentation and his attempt to bring equity uh, to this bill. And, let me, and I would also like to tell the Chairman, I have to go to a, another meeting at this time, Mr. Chairman. If, if I was here, I would vote to bring this matter of the unemployment bill to the floor, uh, but I will have to have to well, leave. Well, as long as we don't need a, a quorum, we'll uh, assume <laughs> that you won't have to vote. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you, Williams. Mr. Chairman, members. Distinguished Majority Whip. I mean Minority Whip. I beg your pardon, uh, <laughs> Mr. Gingrich. Soon to be Majority Whip. Yeah, wishful thinking. <laughs> Unless he's getting ready to change parties. Uh, oh, unless he's getting ready to change parties. He's just changing districts. He's not that's changing. right. That's right. <laughs> Actually, I'm keeping the six. It just happens to float around a little bit. <laughs> Be glad to hear from you, Mr. Gannon. It's nice yeah. to have you before the committee. Thank you. And, and I, I appreciate very much uh, this opportunity to come and speak before the uh, Distinguished Rules Committee. Uh, I believe, Mr. Chairman, that you have an opportunity today to set a motion, in motion a chain of events which will lead to real economic growth and jobs for Americans. It's for this reason I've come before you to request that uh, my bill, H.R. 3130, the Economic Growth Act, be made in order as a substitute to the Unemployment Insurance Reform Act. In other words, Mr. Chairman, I'm asking that the members of the House be given an opportunity to vote to create new jobs instead of simply extending unemployment benefits. 
It's been estimated that the Economic Growth Act will create 1,100,000 new jobs by the end of the decade. In addition, it has a provision which uh, the Home Builders Association has estimated which lead to 220,000 sales of homes to uh, working couples and younger couples, additional sales a year. Uh, I feel strongly that the current attempt to extend unemployment benefits is directed only at a symptom of our economic problem rather than at its root causes. Members of the House deserve the opportunity to vote on a positive economic plan for their constituents. The Economic Growth Act is such a plan. I've attached a detailed summary of the bill to my testimony for the committee to review, but the highlights are a capital gains rate reduction, inflation indexing for capital gains, enterprise zones for inner city and rural poor areas, a permanent extension of the research and experimentation tax credit, an IRA plus plan which would allow every American to have a savings account with a tax-free interest buildup and the right to use that savings account for health, education, or home buying, as well as retirement, a first-time home buyer's tax credit, uh, the right for parents and grandparents to borrow from their IRA to loan to their children and grandchildren to buy their first home, an $8,000 increase in the amount that senior citizens could earn without having to uh, pay a penalty to Social Security, and an economic growth dividend which would provide that any time the economy grew at more than 3% a year, all the additional revenue growth would go to increase the personal deduction to help families and to help take care of children. I want to make just a couple additional points. Two years ago, this House, by a 264-vote margin, passed a capital gains bill. Every estimate we've seen says that bill would have created between a half million and a million jobs. As concerned as I am for the unemployed, my concern is to get the unemployed to work, to give them a job, not just to extend uh, further payments from the government. Uh, clearly what I'm suggesting is different, is unusual, but we've all spent August back home watching extraordinary change in Russia and in Moscow. And, and my concern is to give Americans a chance, give Americans a chance to work, give Americans a chance to buy a house, give Americans a chance to save. And I would just ask this committee to seriously consider the possibility of making an order of vote so we have a debate, have an up and down vote, begin the process, not just bury in committee and say, well, gee, you know, as long as the majority won't bring it out of committee, I guess that doesn't exist. But instead, to give the House a chance uh, to approach the possibility of creating real jobs rather than to approach just paying more for unemployment because we're not creating real jobs. I believe this bill would, in fact, uh, uh, help us come out of the recession and would, would achieve precisely the goals that all of our friends in the Democratic Party say they want to achieve in terms of helping people who want to work. And lastly, and I know this is what would be, would require bringing a bill to the floor directly. We've done it before in the House. It would not be uh, without precedent. Uh, I just think that jobs are that important, that housing is that important, that the right of our senior citizens to work is that important. And so I would urge the committee to consider making an order this substitute, uh, the Economic Growth Act of 1991. Any questions of Mr. Gingrich? Uh, as I understand it, Mr. Gingrich, in this substitute, you don't deal with unemployment compensation extension. This is a, no. This, this is designed to put them to work. In which case, they don't need the unemployment. I, I, heard, I heard that. I was just uh, wanted to make. Let, sure. let me also say, if I might, Mr. Derrick, and I appreciate the question, that this bill has been drafted with expert uh, assistance at, te at Treasury. It is within the budget agreement. Uh, it is a revenue-neutral bill, according to Treasury, and, and therefore would be signed by the President. So this is not some pie in the sky, take care of it later. This fits the budget requirement and meets the budget agreement. Thank you. Mr. Solomon. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I'm very familiar with the, uh, with the Gingrich approach. It's, uh, it's the bill that you introduced on July 31st. And as I understand it, it would, uh, it would uh, reduce capital gains. Uh, it would... Uh, create a first-time home buyer tax credit, it would create uh, enterprise zones, it would create an IRA plus plan to encourage uh, young uh, middle class uh, savings and investments. Uh, if I understand it right, what, what would happen if your amendment, your substitute, this bill, were to prevail on the floor? It would substitute for the committee bill. And the net effect is that by doing that, we would still preserve what is law today, which is the, uh, the committee bill, which extends unemployment benefits in an emergency basis if approved by the president. It preserves that, that stays. So what we do is we give the unemployed help while at the same time you create an opportunity for another 500,000 to a million jobs. 
Now, to me, that makes a great deal of sense. In other words, we're not just doing both. The chairman mentioned that uh, the president's going to have an option of either declaring an emergency or having this tax increase on the American people go into effect. You know, your option is much, much better. It gives the unemployment uh, the advantage of the benefits uh, should, the, uh, should it be needed, while at the same time creates these programs that's guaranteed to create a half million jobs. My God, what better could we ask for? But it I certainly hope your amendment can be approved. But it, it, doesn't, it doesn't extend the unemployment compensation. Yes, it does, no, because it those benefits are law right now but but it, if but the president deems it a, 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 an emergency. But, but if I might I comment, yield back to the gentleman. If I might comment uh, to, my, to the distinguished chairman, if, if our friends in the Democratic Party felt that it was too great a gamble to actually have this as a substitute and thereby replace their, their vehicle, let me suggest that you may want to then instead make it an order as an amendment, as an addition to, because that way, even under your plan, which currently has no job creation part of it, even under your plan, if we were to extend unemployment as you wish to, we still need a component to create jobs and to increase home sales to young couples and to allow senior citizens to work and to have a savings account for everybody. So I would say, even if you decided that the best way to approach this was to make it an amendment to, an addition to the Democratic bill, which I would suggest would also increase the likelihood of the president signing. I suspect if you were to send him an extension of unemployment along with a capital gains cut and a, and a, uh, uh, a permanent indexing and IRAs and enterprise zones, you'd have a totally different response at the White House. And you might then have a package that genuinely both helped those who were unemployed briefly during the period the economy geared up and created a million jobs so that after all, even with the extension, sooner or later it runs out. And all I'm saying is if we give Americans a chance and if we create an opportunity for them to work so that when it does run out, the new job is there, maybe the best of all worlds is to make an amendment to rather than a substitute for. If we were successful in doing that, uh, attaching it as an amendment, I would certainly join you in urging the president to sign that bill into law. And I commend you for coming before the committee. Mr. Boyner, any questions? I, I'm sorry I missed the... Uh uh, testimony from uh, I'll be glad to repeat it if you'd like my but I assume <laughs> I assume your proposal basically you just re reiterated it through the uh, enterprise zones the uh, capital gains uh, IRAs is that basically it, it, it's it's essentially what it does is it combines uh, a capital gains cut indexing for capital gains and a permanent extension of the research and experimentation tax credit and a first-time home buyers tax credit to help uh, working mm -hmm. couples buy their first home and an IRA plus plan to allow everyone to save, and it increases the amount senior citizens can earn to six to by $8,000 a year. And we do it all in a way which the Treasury accountants tell us is revenue neutral and therefore uh, the President could sign because it's within the Budget Act. So it's an effort. The estimate is it creates 1,100,000 new jobs and 220,000 additional home sales a year. Yeah. So, so the, the effort here is basically to stimulate growth and to provide jobs for people. Right. And. Uh, and it's revenue, revenue neutral. And I assume that the administration, uh, do you know that the administration would, would be receptive to yes. a tax proposal that created growth? And uh, I'm, I'm convinced the administration would, would be willing to sign this bill. Uh, and I think, as I just mentioned, if this bill were attached as an amendment to the unemployment extension, my guess is you dramatically increase uh -huh. the chance that they would sign that uh -huh. bill. Well, th that is important for us to know because uh, there are many of us in our in our caucus who who want to encourage uh, the committee on ways and means to report uh, another alternative to what you have, and that's uh, tax cuts for middle-income people. We believe that the way to get growth back into this economy, the way to move out of the recession, is to cut the taxes of the average working middle-income family in this country. And, uh, and, and in fact, it may include some of the provisions which you have indeed uh, given us here today. But it's, it's good to know that the President would be receptive to it this year. And I'm going to do all that I can to make uh, that argument to, to my friends on my side of the aisle. Because I think it's important that we get on with, with, with the issue of, of, uh, of growing in this country and the issue of uh, uh, putting people back to work. Uh, uh, I, I think that debate is just around the corner. I don't know that this is necessarily uh, uh, the exact time for your proposal, but I'm sure you'll be before us again when we have the middle income tax bill the Democrats are supporting before us. Well, if I could comment, I, I think it would be wonderful if we could truly create a bipartisan uh, effort in the House to, to create jobs and economic growth. All I would suggest, uh, and I think you can appreciate the spirit coming from Michigan with the significant unemployment we have in, in Michigan right now, 
is that here in the next week we have an opportunity to bring to the floor and to have a fair debate and to have a fair up or down vote either as a substitute or as an amendment and of course every week we in Congress wait there are thousands of Americans who are unemployed there are thousands of young couples who can't buy a new home mm -hmm. there are people who can't senior citizens who can't work and, and I think you'd find the distribution table on this particular proposal because we have a tax credit for couples under forty three thousand dollars to help them buy a home because we help senior citizens with an additional eight thousand dollars they can earn without social security I think you'd find that there were a lot of very favorable parts to the economic growth act and I would just hate to see us wait for another couple of months when there are people out there who are running out of unemployment and running out of opportunities and we could have a chance next week to add this to a bill and as I say I think certainly at that point you'd have an awful lot of Republicans working to get the administration to sign the bill well, any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, congratulations, Newt, because it is an employment bill to stimulate our economy, give people hope, rather than a few weeks and then the same thing all over again on the bill proposed. We must do something to stimulate. And I think the uh, unemployment bill that's been before us would throw other more people out of work rather than helping, Give, giving temporary relief to those who are unemployed with no hope in the future. So you give uh, hope and your bill makes sense and it should be made as an amendment. Thank you. Mr. McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I strongly, strongly support uh, your recommendation here. Mr. Gingrich, I agree with the majority leader. You mentioned that concern or majority whip. He says our goal should be to get the economy growing and getting people back to work. And uh, while this band-aid to deal with the current dilemma of unemployment uh, is again before us, our last two bills that we've had, the one before we left and the first one back, the solution is, the, is putting people to work, to getting home builders building homes, to get uh, young couples purchasing their first home, to get uh, those of us in our 40s or early 50s that trying to pay for college educations to allow them to, to have uh, a retirement or individual accounts whereby they could pay their educational bills, enterprise zones where crime and unemployment in the inner cities is solved. And uh, when we look at the president, the president has under his authority international affairs, national leadership, and uh, where he's judged on those uh, expressions of uh, American concern around the world for democracy and freedom, he does very well. But when we speak of a domestic agenda, when we speak of putting senior citizens to work that are living below the poverty line, when we speak of enterprise zones that put the inner cities create jobs, when we speak of young people trying to purchase a first home or our parents trying to pay for an education, when we speak of a domestic agenda, here it is. The simple question is, does Congress want to pass a domestic agenda bill? Does Congress wish to have a political platform from which to lob volleys at the White House, or does it care about the unemployed in the inner city? Does it care about the senior citizen that wants to earn something without Uncle Sam standing there with his Social Security handout snatching the check away each month? Does he really care about young couples trying to purchase a home? If Congress cares about those things, then we don't need to do it next year, two years from now, five years from now. We can do it next week. It's now before us. The only thing that can prevent us from dealing with it is if the Rules Committee says no. We say we don't want to hear it. We don't want the will of the Congress to be heard. We don't want to vote on the floor of the House. We will write a rule that denies the elected representatives of the people the opportunity to even vote. That is the only way that this agenda can be denied being considered that next week. I believe your presentation is appropriate. The President has supported it. It is in the, in the limits of the budget agreement. It answers the concerns of which all of us have said we hold. Therefore, it is only fair, it's only appropriate that the Congress should be given the option to work its will by voting yes or no next week. And I trust that the two to one majority of the Democrats to Republicans on the Rules Committee will de not deny America that chance. Let me just say, if I might, Mr. McEwen, that, that first of all, all I'm saying is Let's make an employment bill in order as well as an unemployment bill. Let's give an employment bill a chance on the floor as well as unemployment. And second, that I think in a tradition which, which uh, certainly if you go back and you read the great speeches of a Hubert Humphrey or look at the, the passion 
of traditional liberalism for those who at 65 want to keep working, for those who are 25 and saving and want to buy their first house, for those who've been unemployed 26 weeks, that passion would say, let's take a step now. And when you look at what we saw this summer, we're urging the Russian people to learn about democracy. Well, democracy, it seems to me, ought to include openness and an opportunity for a vote, not smothering ideas in committees. So I would just beg the committee to, to, to either as a substitute or an amendment, make it in order. I'd be very grateful. Thank you very much, Mr. Gingrich. Thank you. The committee will be in recess subject to the call of the chair, which will probably around, be around 3 o'clock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. The House Rules Committee reconvened Thursday afternoon for about 30 minutes. During that afternoon session, members debated and voted on a number of motions, including efforts to repeal the luxury tax. We now bring you Thursday's afternoon proceedings. Committee of Rules will now come to order. Uh, we've concluded the taking of testimony from the witnesses. Uh, the chair will now be in receipt of a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 3040 a rule providing one hour of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chairman and ranking minority member of the Ways and Means Committee. The rule makes in order the Ways and Means Committee amendment in the nature of a substitute now printed in the bill as an original bill for purposes of amendment. <coughs> The rule waives all points of order against the substitute. The rule makes in order only the amendments printed in the report to accompany the resolution. The amendments are the Rostenkowski amendments dealing with school employees, a Williams amendment, and a Rostenkowski amendment dealing with financing. All points of order are waived against all the amendments. The amendments will be considered in order and manner specified in the report and are not subject to amendment. The rule, the first Rostenkowski amendments may be offered on block and are not subject to a demand for a division of the question. Finally, the rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instructions. You have heard the motion, gentlemen, South Carolina. Mr. Solomon. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, having uh, read the rule and uh, looking at uh, what it contains, uh, you've made an, uh, made an order, a Rostenkowski uh, tax amendment. Uh, You've made an order the uh, the Representative Williams' amendment, uh, and yet uh, and a committee amendment by Rostenkowski as well, uh, but none of the Republican uh, requests were allowed. Uh, to me, it's a, a, a very unfair rule. Uh, I think that uh, we certainly should have been allowed the opportunity to have Mr. Gingrich uh, offer his amendment. Uh, he is a Republican leader. Uh, it is a, uh, a major alternative to what is being proposed, and uh, I'm disappointed that we couldn't do that. Uh, well, let, let me say, I, I'm a strong proponent of economic growth, and I'm sure there's much in the Gingrich package uh, that's worthwhile and I'd love to work on, but uh, he uh, didn't have a cost figure on it, hadn't been heard by committee. It's probably in three or four committees' jurisdiction, and you all know, Mr. Solomon, being a respecter of the rules, that this was not the way to bring that bill forward. And we're dealing with an unemployment compensation bill. And although this, his bill probably would provide employment, it, it didn't do a thing to increase the time of unemployment insurance made available to the people that we're trying to serve now. And that's why uh, Mr. Gingrich's bill was not made, not, a, not because he was a Republican, because it was just way beyond the scope. And, uh, and, and it didn't belong at this committee at this time. Well, Mr. Chairman, I respect your, uh, your point of view. Uh, however, uh, Mr. Williams' amendment on the railroads was not germane. It was made in order. Uh, it was not cleared again with the, with the Republican minority. Uh, and it, it just is an unfair way to be treated. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Uh, Gingrich's uh, approach uh, would simply have put the issue on the floor for debate. Uh, we could have either then, after debate, we could have passed his amendment, either in the form of a substitute or as an amendment to your bill. Uh, and if it were defeated, fine, or even if it passed, and then uh, uh, we took it up in conference with the other body, because otherwise we're, we're just, uh, we're liable to fool around here and end up with no bill at all, and I don't know whether that's what some people want, but it, it's no way to treat the unemployed, it's no way to treat those people that really want jobs. So th we won't belabor the point right now. Uh, uh, I have uh, several uh, motions to make in order, and at the appropriate time I would make those, those motions. All right. 
So, do okay. that's the appropriate time, I guess. First, uh, the first uh, motion I would make, uh, you have it in front of you, uh, is a um, motion to make the Gingrich uh, legislation, which is uh, HR 3130, uh, to make that in order as a substitute uh, to the uh, bill before us. And I would so move that, uh, that motion. You've heard the motion of the gentleman from New York, Mr. Solomon, uh, and you've heard the debate on it. Question now comes from that motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 The no's appear to have it. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, and then at this time, I, I won't ask for a recorded vote on that, but I would offer the second motion dealing with Gingrich, uh, and that is to make his, uh, again, H.R. 3130 uh, in order as an amendment to the entire bill, which simply uh, lets your side of the aisle uh, have your day in court. It, it, uh, it will let your bill become law. Uh, if this is added to it, which is simply an employment bill which would create 500,000 to a million jobs for middle class America primarily, those people that are out of work now, the engineers uh, and professional people around the country who no longer have jobs or hope for jobs. And uh, I would move that as a, as a motion to make it in order as an amendment addendum to your bill. Any discussion? If, Mr. McKeon. Maybe heard, I think that uh, would just, express my support for the gentleman's amendment. This simply allows the members of the House to work their will. It precludes in, no one from doing or saying anything. It merely says that if we want to have a domestic agenda considered by the Congress next week, here is one that can be considered, and this amendment makes it permissible. In other words, it doesn't, it doesn't pass anything. It doesn't change anything. It means that we have the right to debate it on the floor. And I would certainly appeal to my colleagues to say that uh, we should be given that opportunity, and that should not be prevented, if at all possible. Mr. Chairman, Chairman of South Carolina, Mr. Uh, Mr. Garrett, as, as you would uh, note from the testimony uh, and the questions and the comments made by the members of, of this committee, I think most of us are in agreement with what uh, Mr. Gingrich is trying to uh, accomplish. And as a matter of fact, the Democratic leadership is coming out shortly with a uh, bill that will give uh, uh, tax relief to the middle class uh, in this country. Uh, but right now, I think that this is an unemployment compensation extension bill. This is primarily, and, and I really do think that this goes far outside. And, and, and really, to, to say that it would be in any way germane to the bill that we have before us would be stretching it. And so I would uh, would not be able to support it. Would I ask my colleagues not to as well? Any other discussion? If not, on the motion of the gentleman from New York, Mr. Solomon. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Chairman, might I have a recorded have vote on it, please? Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. No. Mr. Bevinson. No. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bonnier. No. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. Mr. Gordon. No. Ms. Ms. Slaughter? No. Mr. Solomon? Yes. Mr. Quillen? Mr. Dreyer? Mr. McKeown? Yes. Mr. Chairman? No. <clears throat> On this matter, two members have voted in the affirmative, six in the negative. The motion is not adopted. Mr. Chairman? Gentlemen, may I, Mr. Solomon? The uh, ranking uh, member, Mr. Gratison from Ohio, would you, would you want to offer this? No, very right. yeah is uh, uh, had an amendment which would, uh, to, to the rule, which would make an order an amendment to be offered by Representative Gratison, which would strike Title V, which includes the emergency designation and the directed scoring by the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, we all know what that amendment was, and uh, uh, what it does is uh, it takes away the, uh, the obligation uh, that the emergency would become permanent law uh, should this bill pass with or without the President's signature. And I would so move this, uh, this motion. Well, the gentleman from the ARC is correct. This wouldn't cost any more but, uh, than the underlying bill, but it would require a number of Budget Act waivers, and if enacted, would cause a sequester. So on that matter, I'd have to oppose it. Question comes to the motion of the gentleman from New York. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 The no's appear to have it. Gentleman from New York. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I have uh, uh, a motion to make an order the Army Amendment. Uh, the amendment to the rule would make an order an amendment to be offered by Representative Army, which would repeal the entire luxury tax. Now, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm the last one to uh, want to uh, 
uh, bust the, uh, the budget agreement from uh, last year. I voted against that agreement, predicting that this Congress would budget, bust it the first time it had the opportunity. Uh, it's done that. Uh, and uh, uh, in my own opinion, this is not a revenue loser. Uh, this simply would create, again, more jobs, more income tax coming into the, uh, to the coffers. And I would hope that uh, Mr. Army's amendment to repeal the re luxury tax, uh, which has cost this government uh, revenues, uh, be made in order. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, question that uh, the additional luxury tax has cost this uh, uh, country uh, money. Uh, you know, we're going through a recession. People are not buying fifty and seventy thousand dollar automobiles and million dollar boats as much as they were a couple of years ago. I suggest that's probably the, the same reason. And I think it's rather uh, it stretches the imagination to on an unemployment compensation bill extension where we're trying to help a guy out there who doesn't have any money to buy food for his family that we uh, uh, put on there doing away with a 10 percent luxury tax on on luxury goods of millions of, of dollars and so uh, I just think that's you know stretching a little too far it, it goes beyond uh, certainly way beyond uh, even what Mr. Gingrich tried to do in his amendment I would suggest we not support it. <coughs> if I might Mr. just uh, I might just sum up uh, Mr. Uh, Derek, I don't think that the unemployed boat uh, workers of America would, uh, would appreciate your statement. I know that those people that uh, live in the Adirondack Mountains on uh, Lake Champlain and Lake George who are unemployed because they have no boats to sell and nobody to buy them uh, certainly don't agree with you, but uh, well, we won't argue the point at this well, point. Well, as far as I'm concerned, they're unemployed because of the Reagan economic policies uh, of the 1980s. The gentleman knows better than that. That's oh, no, I statement. don't, and most of the people of this well, country don't either. Well, gen well, gentlemen, you I'd be glad uh, to yield to the gentleman. Well, uh, obviously, uh, the fact that since 1982, there have been 32 million jobs created on this planet, 23 million of them in, in one country, just one country. The United States of America is, is uh, kind of uh, stretching a point, if there ever was, to say that the reason that the boat industry, which was sacked right upside the head with a sledgehammer, saying that uh, our international competitiveness, we're going to put a 10 percent surcharge on anything produced in America, not in the Bahamas, not in Bermuda, not in Amsterdam, but only in America and able to destroy that purchasing, not, not the number of boats purchased, but those purchased from America, and laying those people off, to blame that on Ronald Reagan is really stretching a point. The facts are in. Every day, people are losing their jobs in the boating business, and I sit here at this moment and assure you, with, I am absolutely convinced that this Congress, the 102nd Congress, is going to repeal this very, very unwise move. Well, and we'll do it sometime in the next six to eight months, and better now than later, better sooner than later, so we can save some of the people. As I mentioned, Carver and Hatteras and the others that are filing for bankruptcy, you can pick up anyone who's in this business. And those of us who, who don't live on the eastern coast or, don't, or San Diego or deal in it so much, but if you pick up the advertisements and see what is done by all of our international competitors in big, bold print, not subject to the American uh, luxury tax, and that competitive edge that is destroying American jobs and American products for what? Because it sounds cute to get up in one or two places and thump the table and say, look, I got the rich guy. And it's the old thing that Winston Churchill called the cult of envy. And it was, it, was, it was done as a mistake. It's proven to be an error. It is counterproductive to America. It is losing revenue for our country. It's increasing the debt, and it's throwing people out of work. And I'm convinced the 102nd Congress is going to, is going to repeal it and, and, and correct it. Uh, the only question is, do we do it now or do it later? And I say that it's long, long overdue, and I support the gentleman's amendment. Mr. McEwen, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Congress may well repeal it, uh, but this isn't, isn't the place to do it. And I there again think it rather inconsistent that you offer this argument on ha behalf of the people in Appalachia. Who are unemployed. People uh, that are unemployed uh, in America, yeah, on those who are trying to so help with this bill. So uh, people can't buy boats that cost millions of dollars to help the people in Appalachia. I think that's rather inconsistent. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Sorry. allow me to respond oh, to that. The idea ahead. that everybody who works at a boat manufacturing facility is a multimillionaire is, is I, don't under, I don't understand the corollary. The fellow who is, who is surviving and eking out an existence by being a molder of plastics or buying, being a producer of, of uh, 
of uh, maritime products, the fact that those orders for the lights or for the doorknobs or for the, for the wooden doors, those people that are being unemployed it, say you just have to eat it because it's ultimately going to be purchased by a millionaire and we don't like them. Uh, on behalf of those people, we should take them into consideration. They're the union that's coming down here writing the letters. They're the ones that are filling our desk with mail. They're the ones that are pleading. And to say that we are so anxious to say that we stabbed a millionaire, that you've just got to absorb the blow, on behalf of the people in Appalachia or, or in Upper Adirondacks or anybody around the Great Lakes that's in the maritime building business, for those people that are closing their doors, those are whom an unemployment bill should be directed toward helping. And I would think that if, that if we're done on an economic basis and on a logical basis and not a political basis, uh, we would attempt to, to rescue them. Mr. McEwen, it's really very simple. We're going through a depression and unfortunately people can't afford to buy million dollar votes like they did. So uh, we'll increase back, the taxes back, on American back, products back, alone back. and but make you're sure. Blaming, but you're blaming their unemployment on something uh, that doesn't exist. But anyway, that's all I have to say on that. If the I could uh, reclaim my time for a minute, and I just, uh, I just can't help uh, bringing this up because uh, I think sometimes my good friend uh, Butler Derrick has a little uh, guilty feeling uh, for having voted for all of these big spending programs that develop this huge debt that we have in America today, and he likes to turn around and blame it on, uh, on Ronald Reagan. Uh, the truth of the matter is that I believe that uh, Mr. Butler Derrick and, uh, and all of the big spenders that are listed on this National Taxpayers Union list, of which Mr. Derrick, B Butler Derrick and one other member from South Carolina are listed, uh, they are the ones that said that the Reagan budget is dead on arrival and not one of Reagan's budgets ever passed. They went on then to introduce their own budgets and that's how we got this $3.7 tri uh, trillion dollar debt that we have today. Uh, I would just as, as I mentioned earlier, was Ronald Reagan not president during the 1980s? Does he not take any responsibility for the fact that this nation became, when, when, he, went, when he went in office, this Absolutely nation was none. the world's greatest creditor nation. When he went out of office, this nation was the world's greatest uh, debtor nation. Mr. Chair, it was, may I it reclaim was my the, time, uh, and then you can the, recognize Mr. Derek, Derek afterwards? With the, with I'll the gentleman, gentleman I will reclaim the my the time, time, and I will say this. You know, there is no president of the United States that can ever spend one dime without this Congress putting its stamp of approval on it. Not one president. As a matter of fact, I even think, uh, Mr. Derrick, that you were here in this Congress when the Congress of the United States took the President of the United States to court and forced him to spend money that was not necessary. So, you know, no President can be responsible for a deficit. Only the United States Congress and you people at this table uh, are partly responsible for that. I'm happy to say that Mr. Wait till I finish. I'm happy to say that Mr. McEwen is on the other side of this sheet, which says the National Pac Taxpayers Hit Parade as one of the most fiscally responsible members, and I happen to be the only member from New York that is on that list as well. I'm ashamed to say. So the gentleman would well, yield uh, to me. Uh, I'd be glad to yield to the gentleman. The, 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 <laughs> so much time is going to happen. Yeah, the, the, the gentleman has, ma has made a point it, so, uh, that needs to be emphasized, and that is from George Washington until 1974, presidents had the authority to not spend money that Congress appropriated. It was a management authority. And therefore, if there was a deficit, it was because the president was a partner. In 1974, overriding a presidential veto, the Congress passed the National Impoundment Act, which says that the president of the United States is obligated to spend the funds that have been appropriated by the Congress. And the gentleman from New York specifically said that when the President Reagan introduced his budget over a five-year period that would take us to a balanced budget, Everyone went screaming to the floor and to the television cameras saying, it's dead, it's dead, it's dead. And our dear friends on the other side of the aisle, it became so bloody that they began to, 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 uh, to correlate it and say, all right, you can speak on agriculture and you can speak on defense and you can speak on interior. And so that then over, they were over a period of two weeks explained that the Reagan budget that would take us over five years to a balanced budget was dead on arrival year after year after year. And so it kept being shoved out and shoved out and shoved out. And as a result, then having increased the deficit, having prided ourselves that Congress wouldn't balance the budget, we then go running home to, and say, it, Ronald Reagan made me do it. Ronald Reagan made me do it. The facts are in. The president cannot spend a dime. He cannot put money in his helicopter. He cannot mow his lawn unless the Congress gives the authority to do it. Every dime that is spent has to be appropriated by the Congress if there is a deficit is because the Congress chose to create one. 
It cannot do it, the president cannot do it on his own, only the Congress can. So therefore, who was president at the time is not the appropriate question. The question is, who controlled the budget committees of the United States Congress? That is the answer. Gentlemen's time has expired. Just one, Mr. Mr. Well, Chairman. Guys, you've had 10 minutes. Well, Great, uh, I'm also the ranking member, and I'll yield my time in just one minute, unless you want me to you can take up time. something a little bit later. Yeah, sure. But I just wanted to uh, just cite that what the gentleman is citing uh, uh, extemporaneously from is the Constitution of the United States, We the People, Article 1, which says, no money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law, which means made by the Congress of the United States of America. So, Mr. Derrick, uh, I think that settles your argument. So Mr. Gordon, Gordon, I yield back the balance of my time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. I, need to keep so I want to right. go into full. Since Mr. Derrick's, Derrick's name has been mentioned, <laughs> go ahead, Mr. Derrick. Well, you know, you can argue all you like and make That's all right. these fancy statements and refer to these little rating organizations all you like. But you know, uh, the fact of the matter is that, as I recall, Ronald Reagan was elected president in 1980. And when he was elected president, the deficit of this country was less than uh, $50 billion a year. And the overall debt of this country was around $1 trillion. When he left office, eight years later, the debt of this country was $3 trillion. It had gone up three times uh, what it had taken it almost 200 years to go up before. And uh, Why did we, you let we that came, happen? Well, now, I did, now you just oh, be I'm quiet so, over there until I get through. Okay. Uh, you know, and uh, we, we, when we went, when he gained office, we, we were the greatest creditor nation in the world. When he left office, we were the greatest debtor nation in the world. Ronald Reagan signed more tax increases than any other president in modern history. He signed every one of those bills that you are talking about. And uh, let me just tell you a little story and then I'll be through. I, there's this man who I respect very much in my district who's a very large industrialist and he's a very Republican. He came to me in about 1988, and all of a sudden he said, you know, I've been thinking about this thing for a long time. He said, you know, Ronald Reagan is really the greatest liberal president this country <laughs> has had in modern times. I said, well, how did you possibly uh, reach that conclusion? He said, because he is the biggest spender that we have ever had in the history of the peacetime presidency. And, uh, you know, you just can't walk away from that, Mr. McEwen, and you can't walk away from that, Mr. Solomon, the fact that he left this country in one bad shape with debt. I yield Mr. to Mr. Gordon. Gordon. Do, do you have anything else? Mr. Chairman, I know we, 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 I know need, to, we, oh, need, to, <laughs> we need to do away with the theater and get back to, uh, to business at hand. But I think before we're doing so, we also should clear the record and, and, and set the facts straight. And the facts are that our, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle have continued to say if we'd only passed Ronald Reagan's budget, uh, then the deficit would have gone down. And so why didn't you do that? The fact of the matter is the Democratic Congress didn't pass Ronald Reagan's budget because we cut it. And that, and that, and that the Democratic Congress, and there's, uh, That's simply not true. No, the fact, <laughs> no, it, no what, what, is, what is true is, is that the Democratic Congress oh, need to, we oh, need to. <laughs> we need to do away with the theater and get back to, uh, to business at hand. But I think before we're doing so, we also should clear the record and, and, and set the facts straight. And the facts are that our, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle have continued to say if we'd only passed Ronald Reagan's budget, uh, then the deficit would have gone down. And so why didn't you do that? The fact of the matter is the Democratic Congress didn't pass Ronald Reagan's budget because we cut it. And that, and that, and that the Democratic Congress, and there's, uh, that's simply not true. No, the fact, <laughs> no, it, no. What, what is, what is true is, is that the Democratic Congress passed, passed budgets in the entire time that Ronald Reagan was in office that had, that had a smaller deficit than President Reagan has, had proposed. Those are the facts. But gentlemen, you no, I, okay. I, I yield back to the, to uh, the chairman. Uh, Mr. Uh, Billinson hasn't had his time yet. Right. I got to get out of here because my kid's running for office in Baltimore. I got to go to the precinct, <laughs> precinct work. But I also want to run as Republican. Or 
<laughs> I want to preface my remarks to my friend from New York, where I originally came from, as he knows, that I'm not on that list of big spenders. That's right. I'm one of five Democrats from California. I know that, and I, I, I admire you for it. Otherwise, you would have mentioned it, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say two things. The first is money cannot be spent unless the president signs an appropriation bill. Mr. Reagan could have vetoed a lot more of the spending bills than, in fact, he did. He didn't he veto an awful lot. He talked a lot about it, Correct. and he should have, I think. Cut, I think he would have cut spending a little bit more. The second thing is to validate what, what our friend from Tennessee, Mr. Gordon, said. It's absolutely correct that each of the eight years that Mr. Reagan was president, the Congress appropriated a lower amount of money than the president requested in his original budget submission to the Congress. Those are the facts. So for those, I'm not trying to get into the argument here, but those who suggested that Mr. Reagan wanted us to spend at a lower level than in fact we spent are not, Fine. Are not correct. I haven't had any time, Mr. Chairman. You haven't had any. No, no, no. I moved the previous question. He, he, generous, he, he generously no, yeah. yielded. I, I'd like to be recognized on that point, if I may. And that is, I know, I know that that is something that the Appropriations Committee comes to the floor and says every year. I think that's what Mr. Whitten's trying to say when he's. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, is, is simply this that you, they, the President proposes a five year budget. And in the first year, he says that if we close down these particular offices, if we do away with this program, if we consolidate these, we will reduce spending over these five years to such and such a level. Then the Congress on that first year comes running up and says, absolutely not. He was going to do away with this, and he's going to do away with that. He was going to close this department. But we're not going to let it happen. And all the interest groups come in, and we all get our awards early in the year, and everybody congratulates everyone. So then it all gets shifted out of here. And so the next year, rather than having cut a department in half so that over three years it would go to zero, you've got full funding the next year. And so he comes through with a full budget and does it all over again. Congress effectively pushes it over and over and over, and then to take, th then then takes the ultimate the ultimate escape and say, aha, it's not my fault. <laughs> the gentleman yields as soon as I complete the sentence. Dryer isn't he, he then says he? that the reason that all of this spending is going on is Ronald Reagan's fault. Now you've got to make up your mind. Either he did want to cut those programs and you saved them or Ronald Reagan was going to save them all along in the first place. But for those of us who know the facts and know that if his budgets had been enacted and we would have had a balanced budget well into the early 80s instead of Congress shoving it out, you cannot then come back having increased the spending, having gone around collecting your awards, having patted yourselves on the back on saving all of these, these 1960s programs, then go around and say, well, Ronald Reagan made me do it. All right. I move my motion. Any more, any more civics lessons? <laughs> <laughs> Question comes to the motion of the gentleman from New York, Mr. Solomon. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 Mr. Chairman, I ask for a recorded vote. General the clerk no. will call the roll. <laughs> Mr. No. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, wait a minute. There's been so much discussion. I'd like. We're voting on the luxury tax. Is that yes, that's right. Okay, We're voting on. Uh, on yes, whether, whether we repeal the luxury, right. luxury tax. There's another, another boat tax coming up here right. in a minute. All right. Mr. No. Mr. Beale. No. Mr. Cross. No. Mr. Bonnet. Mr. Hall. Mr. Weed. No, no, no. No. <laughs> Mr. Slaughter. No. Mr. Solomon. Mr. Chairman. No, oh, I mean, uh, yes. <laughs> Mr. Crow. On behalf of unemployed workers, absolutely, yes. No. <coughs> We're picking up. On this matter, two members have voted in the affirmative, seven in the negative. The amendment by the gentleman from the act does not uh, pass. Mr. Chairman, we have to speed Solomon. this up. I have to go and engage a colloquy with okay. uh, Mr. Bonnier on the schedule for next week on the floor. But uh, <coughs> I have an, a, a motion to make in order my amendment which would repeal the user no, fee, which would repeal the user fee on boats. Uh, this uh, resolution, a resolution identical to it, passed the House in a form of sense of Congress by, uh, I think it had 462 votes, and I think every member of the Rules Committee voted for it. And I think just about every member of the Rules Committee on both sides are sponsors of this legislation. The amendment would simply repeal the fee on recreational boaters, which was enacted as part of last year's budget agreement. Um, and uh, as far as uh, Mr. Derrick, I think you ought to be interested in this because you were worried about uh, the little guy. And what this does is take the user fee off the little guy and it puts it, uh, charges it to the commercial shippers and their representatives as a user fee. So we shift it 
from the little guy who owns these little 16-foot boats that operate them up in Lake George, New York, uh, that don't have anything to do with the Coast Guard. Uh, and I'm sure you can support this amendment. It's a, uh, everybody across this country wants this voter fee repeal. No. Here's your opportunity to do it. Uh, Mr. Derrick. And do a little something for the little guy. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Solomon, I want you to know what high regard I hold you in and what a wonderful person I think you are. And, and I hold you in the highest esteem. But I must tell you that you are absolutely haywire on this amendment. <laughs> that uh, <laughs> boat fees are treated as offsetting receipts, reducing the amount of spending, your amendment would result in additional direct spending of $135 million in 1992 alone. And by 1995, your amendment would uh, result in $700 million additional deficit spending. Uh, uh, and then it would expire under the law. So, I mean, you are, Mr. I mean, what Mr. Derrick? Yes, sir. Let me just say, uh, Mr. you use the same accolades, and I mean it sincerely. <laughs> but the truth is that Mr. Roskinkowski has said that he is going to act on the Bonnier Bill, on the Bonnier Bill, which will repeal this tax and put the, are you, uh, are the you, offsets are you, over on the commercial by the, by, shippers. By the way, I yield, and I'm supporting it. By the way, I yield to the time to you. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, now I I've got to get down time, to the floor very and, quickly. And now I'll reclaim uh, my time and want to tell you in what high regard I do hold you, uh, even though your, <laughs> am your amendment is haywire. <laughs> Any other conversation? On, this, on the motion of the gentleman from New York, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 The no's appear to have it. Roll call vote. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. No. Mr. Bielitsen. No. Mr. Frost. No. Mr. Bonnier. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat? No. Mr. Gordon? No. Ms. Slaughter? Mr. Solomon? Yes. Mr. Quillen? Mr. Dreyer? Mr. McEwen? Yes. Mr. Chairman? No. On this matter, two members having voted in the affirmative, six in the negative, the motion of the gentleman from the act does not carry. Mr. Gentlemen, Chairman? Solomon? Uh, I just have one further motion. and. Uh, <laughs> that is to make an open rule and order. Uh, you know, we've talked about the unfairness of the rule, uh, that it only makes Democrat amendments in order. Uh, I really think that uh, because of the extended debate that we've had right here, just between seven or eight of us, Wait, it is, yield I'd be glad to yield to the gentleman. Are you suggesting that an open rule would allow the kind of debate that we've had in this committee today? An open rule would allow 500, 435 members of Congress to express you mean their we, will. We would have this debate magnified about 300 <laughs> times if we had an open rule. Uh -huh. Well, if the gentleman is opposed to democracy, that's all right with me. But uh, uh, at any rate, uh, I would so move the uh, I would so move the, uh, the the motion, Mr. Chairman. Uh, question comes on the gentleman's motion. The gentleman from New York. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 Those appear to have it. The motion is not adopted. Question now comes to the motion of the gentleman from South Carolina. All those in favor say aye. No. Good thing shouldn't be carried uh, to the extreme. <laughs> <laughs> Do you wanna, Excuse me, Mr. Can we count that as a <laughs> yeah, aye, because the second one was supposed to. All those in the, uh, against say no. No. All right. uh, in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The motion is adopted. The rule will be handled by the gentleman from uh, Michigan, Mr. Barnier. The Rules Committee. We don't have anything scheduled anymore. So. Let's take less adjourned. All right. All right. So the Rules Committee now stands adjourned. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. No, no. Here is a reminder now to be with us tonight for a special C-SPAN preview of this coming week's confirmation hearings of Robert Gates, President Bush's choice to head up the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. We will discuss intelligence gathering with the executive director of the Association of Former Intelligence Officers. You will meet William Colby, CIA director during the Nixon and Ford years, and we will look at the background of Robert Gates and some of the issues that may be raised during this week's confirmation hearings. That's all tonight, beginning at 8 o'clock Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time, here on C-SPAN 2. Coming up next, it's this week's Journalist Roundtable program. For more than a decade, C-SPAN has brought you live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of...